Good day, Mariano. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. My pleasure, Guy. It's really uh, an honor to be invited. Well, I, we tried uh, coordinating this uh, a couple of years ago and it, uh, we didn't get it done, so I'm glad we're doing it. I had taken a hiatus from doing this um, because of the uh, uh, my internet connection was always good, and but now that I've got a good internet connection and I'm doing this over something like Zoom or Skype, I'm back at doing this, so I'm glad that we've uh, scheduled this. For our audience, could you please introduce yourself and give us a little background, tell us where you grew up and where you went to college and what you studied, uh, where you live and work now, and uh, then maybe kind of segue into what are some of the more interesting things you've done in your career and kind of establish a baseline for our, our audience. Okay, um, it's a long list, so I will try to keep up with the, the at least the, the beginning and you can help me with the rest. Uh, my name is Mariano Bernardes. I was born and raised in Argentina, Buenos Aires, Argentina, um, from parents uh, who were born and raised in Spain. Uh, I moved to the United States in 1998. I live in Chicago currently. I became a citizen of the United States in 2008 and also a citizen of Spain because of my father. I study um, at the University of Buenos Aires. I got there, I received a PhD. Um, uh, on those days, it was uh, a PhD on philosophy. Although my other, we would call in, in the United States, majors were in, um, in sociology. And um, I have a brief stint on architecture. All, the, all those things came later on to bite me uh, in my uh, city doctor's work. And um, I study finance and management at the University of Chicago um, in the Booth School of Business, government uh, in uh, the Oxford Blatani School of Government and um, in the National Institute for Public Administration in Argentina. Um, those who are basically uh, my, my background. Plus, I would say um, a very interesting uh, stay at the Professional Education Division at Arthur Anderson in St. Charles, where we work and learn about computer-based training, the early days, I'm talking about the early 80s, and, um, and also uh, artificial intelligence before uh, we, we, we knew what was that. Excellent. Thank you so much for establishing uh, that kind of background. So that's basically... Thank you. Can you share with us a little bit about your first exposure to what I call HPT, human performance technology, or evidence-based practices for performance improvement, or however you refer to it? And let's start with, how do you refer to this? And when were you exposed? Well, I think that there are a lot of different disciplines. I'm a I'm on the, on, the, on the side of keeping the disciplines uh, independent and using them accordingly. So um, I try always to, to represent or integrate what I call a multidisciplinary approach rather than purely interdisciplinary approach. Because I'm a practitioner, I was going to say that it sounds that I have a big academic background, but it, back in 82, when I got my PhD, I swore to myself I would never go back which of course I failed to accomplish because Roger Kaufman brought me back to do some kind of academic work. But I work all my life as a consultant. I started business, I started uh, four companies, two in Argentina, two in the United States and one in Spain. And um, I'm in boards, etc. So when I think about the field, I, I think the basic, the larger field of what we call is value creation. It's, how do you make things uh, that create value for, for people, for society, for yourself? From then on, in, not on, uh, you get the societal performance, then you, you get the organizational performance, and then the individual performance. Usually, you start the other way. You start by working in some field. For example, myself, I started in simultaneously education, instructional systems design, and um, process improvement, we would call it uh, time and motion studies, 
Um, and I have a side work on management, working with, uh, with supervisors and middle managers uh, back then in the 70s. So all those things evolved eventually. Uh, I moved up in my career and I became partner at Arthur Anderson. I worked with other people and my customers, my clients were usually CEOs or, or top managers. So their problems became my problems and then I started looking at the organization and move, move a little to the 90s. And in the 90s, most of my customers in management consulting were CEOs and they started talking about what was going on around the company. And that's when uh, I started working in societal performance. Actually, I brought in 1995 uh, Roger Kaufman to Argentina and we work in organizing or helping four towns where a oil company that was my primary client was um, failing to keep people uh, to stay. So that, that's the way I, I got finally to the stage we are now that is working primarily in communities and, for example, mega regions like Arizona, Sonora, and we deal with the turning around um, slums and program we call city doctors, alluding to the fact that we are like a family doctor. We take care of not just the buildings or the income or the, well, we try to make all the things work together, which is quite a thing. Anyway, that's, that's uh, the, the way I would describe the field. And my first exposure was with the specific ISPI. The anecdote is interesting, I think. Um, um, a client of mine, um, brought the ISPI brochure and said, we would like to, uh, you to go with some of the people you work with to present what you did in um, um, Banco, the Bank of Galicia in Buenos Aires. I said, okay. So I started this time going to ISPI to present my clients' projects with my clients. I never went by myself um, to an ISPI conference. In some cases, I brought also middle managers to, to figure out what was there that they didn't know about uh, how to make things happen in an organization. So um, that's how I got involved on the academic side, of course, in the 70s. The first book that fell into my um, hands was uh, Robert Majors, uh, the... Um, the first of the SIGPAC analyzing performance program uh, that was really, and of course the, the goals. And uh, on the other hand, I, I got the um, systemic planning of education in Spanish from a guy called, uh, named uh, Roger Kaufman, whom I finally met 10 years later in Atlanta, Georgia for an ASPA conference where I was presenting computer-based training project with Bank of Boston and another bank in Argentina that they brought to the conference. So that's the way I got somehow involved. But I always had a, um, a very eclectic kind of tools because I was trying to use, uh, I would say, I think I, I've used even evangelical pastors to make things happen. So I, I didn't try, uh, you know, with doctors, but... If they come, welcome. So that's my my spectrum. <laughs> so well, th that's excellent. So you, uh, Bob Mager, were, were was one of your in early influences, and Roger Kaufman. Um, uh, can you share with us a little bit more about uh, some of those early influences? Because we'd like to point people to. You know, those be either people, books, or articles. And the, the book, uh, Mager book, that was my first influence was that analyzing performance problems or they really ought to want to, um, that's a classic. But um, so as a way to point others to those kinds of resources, who else uh, was part of your early influences in this field? Yeah, uh, well, first of all, I must admit that I drank the, the whole six packs. Um, so, um, I really enjoy those books. Early influences, I would say, um, in addition to, to Roger and of course, Gary Rambler and, um, um, 
my, my connection with Gilder was later uh, on down the road because at the time Gilder passed a few years after I joined uh, ISPI um, and he was no longer active and he wasn't so well known outside the United States and I guess the ISPI circle. Um, the other, I would say probably the other, the other important influence is C.K. Prahala and Peter Drucker. And I would say those are um, typical for my thing in terms of uh, looking outside in and uh, looking also at the connection between um, making, uh, doing well and doing good. As, as uh, reciprocally uh, related. I would say C.K. Prahala has a, a 2002 article with uh, Hammond called Serving the World's Poor Profitably. And uh, of course, Peter Drucker has his series about uh, 21st century management where he was precisely explaining that um, results or value is created outside a company and inside a company you, we only have costs. So um, something that uh, um, my stint in Anderson helped me to, to figure out well. Uh, Anderson uh, the, in the 80s still didn't have the problems that ended the way we all know, but it was visible that they were not caring enough for the well-being of their clients and their clients' clients. And that seemed to be a foregone question, but if your clients are doing bad things, bad products, poor services, chances are that you are going to have um, a bad association and your, your revenue will go the same way your client goes. So um, that was basically the logic. And if I have to add more, I would add Greg Kersley and Gloria Giri on the computer-based training side. I have an anecdote about that. The, who, who was my main influence for computer-based training? A movie director. I, uh, I, yeah, the guy was a particularly kind of a, uh, a very bohemian guy that was assigned to the uh, educational technology department at the United Nations in Buenos Aires. And they didn't know what to do with these guys, so they sent it to me. He was twice my age. I was in my early 30s and he was in his 50s. And he, he kept driving people crazy because nobody knew what to do. He was uh, asking their, their uh, collaborators to take dictation for scripts and things like that. And uh, finally, he, one day he came and put on top of my desk a, a nice slim uh, box. And it was a TI-99 uh, A Texas Instrument home computer. And he said, I just bought it. It's wonderful. I think we can make a movie with this. Of course, he was kind of <laughs> ahead of himself, but uh, I had no idea what to do with that. So he brought a, a small red TV set, black and white, hook it up to the, and we started. And so he only had a, a manual for basic. So I studied basic and we organized the first basic program, which of course didn't produce a movie, but we made a simulation of it pandemic uh, with the, um, to help the directors of the hospitals to figure out why was it important to look at the budget in primary care and in, in prevention. So we created a, a simulation with a couple of mathematicians they had there in the United Nations uh, to, to create crisis and a lot of things all in basic, I was the programmer, and that was the way I got involved in the, uh, then I, I got the free um, rain in bringing three more uh, computer, home computers. By the way, my home computer was 16K at the time, and the mainframe uh, that the institute had for uh, carrying all the statistics was four. So mine was free, and they paid big bucks uh, to get the other one. So and that was as fast as it went. This is 1980. Thank you. 
So you've had so you've had that computer-based training uh, beginning in instructional design, and uh, of course, then people like Mager would have been uh, very influential. And uh, but so you've you've worked with some of the other people that are from the ISPI family, and we're both part of that uh, ISPI family. But um, you mentioned before. Uh, we started the video, some of the other people, such as uh, Dale Brethauer and Bob Carlton. And, and uh, what, what can you share with us about what, what, did, uh, what, what was their influence on you? Well, uh, in 2005, uh, Roger asked me to help him in setting up a, the first PhD and MBA program in societal performance at the Sonora Institute of Technology in Mexico. And he wanted to, to make a, an all-star uh, faculty. So we invited uh, Gary Rambler, Bob Carlton, um, David Dower, um, Ingrid Guerra, and of course, Roger and myself as the first group. So a lot of what I learned uh, was uh, basically working for doing the first four years of the program with all these eclectic group of people. Uh, we were together in Mexico um, one week a month during three years until Gary's passing. And um, we had you know, meetings to design and redesign. We, we build the program as it is now, uh, also working with uh, our first doctoral students. And the, Peculiar characteristic of this program was that we didn't graduate people, we graduated uh, projects and organizations. So each one of the doctoral candidates had to have a, a startup or a project, could be profit or non-profit. And uh, we, we started with 34 projects. And, um, and we measure the impact in terms of jobs, revenue for the region, and then in towards Produce services and the kind of things ranging from I don't know from making um, parts for the 787 in Guaymas to making uh, lamps for towels with antlers collected by the Mayo tribe in northern Sonora. Um, so that was the spectrum of things, and in that process, of course, I learned a lot by interacting with Dale with uh, Gary, not only um, we had class and we have consulting after the class, and then we have online work on Blackboard to review the projects on a daily basis. And I was working as partner sometimes, I was a translator, and, um, but we also had meetings overnight and under the effects of tequila to <laughs> that's all other things. <laughs> and of course I was in charge also of herding the cats all these big people and, um, and the Mexicans who had their own things. So I had to um, keep things going. I, I really developed a, 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 a big friendship with all of them, uh, enough to lament um, uh, Gary's passing and, and Bob's as well. Um, but, um, but it was a real full practical and theoretical experience. And we invented things in the way. Some of the things I used were co-designed with, uh, with Gary and Dave, for example, mm -hmm. in Tucson. What an experience. Uh, I'm jealous. Um, <laughs> I've known well, those people for a long time. I've known, I've known those people for a long, long time, and I miss their passing as well. And I got a chance to work with uh, a couple of them uh, on directly on the on engagements, but um, yeah, there's all there was always something to be learned from those people, and that was a that was a great group to learn from. Let me switch gears here a little bit and ask you if uh, uh, again this is this way of showing people, giving people an example. But if you were to share with us your thirty second elevator speech on what it is that you do. If you were at a neighborhood party and you, there's a new neighbor and they ask you, Mariano, what do you do? What would your response be? Um, 
I would say that the, if I have to summarize, I try to, to make things work for the people who live on those things and for the larger group of the people who depends on that. That's what I basically do. Um, there is no possibility, as I see, uh, of, of making money without adding value in the long run. And uh, in the crazy world we live in, uh, and I grew up in a crazy world than this one, if you can believe that, um, you have to, sooner or later, to realize that you have to deal with all those things. So that requires to bring together people who are very different, have different ideas. And, and you have also all kinds of social problems, even political problems. Many of the projects we develop, we have to deal with people on the left, people on the right, uh, people on elections, people on budgets, people on government, people on private sector, and, um, and people who are very poor and live in $2 a day uh, and, and learn from them. So uh, that's, that's one of the interesting things. So what I do is that I'm trying to figure out how can you, for example, turn a slum into a neighborhood in three years. Or how can we develop 40 companies and keep Mexicans in Mexico instead of sending them uh, to the United States? Or how can we um, turn a, a gang reading uh, gangs in Panama into tourist guys? Because the guys make more money with uh, cocaine, but they want to live longer than 25. So, all the methods to do this are developed um, on the ground with a lot of these books you see here, but a lot of care in looking around yourself, eyes on the street. Jane Jacobs, another major influence for me, not from my HPP, it's Jane Jacobs, the famous um, urbanist, said that that was the key thing. You have to walk uh, the place and connect with people. So um, that's why, what I do. I usually uh, bring together people that uh, can help with, whenever they are, wherever they are, however they are, and I have to deal with that. That's what I do. Thank you. Can you share with us uh, as a lifelong learner what your current focus or next focus is for your own learning? I, I, sorry. I, so, so are you, uh, are you uh, trying to learn something new and can share with us as a lifelong learner, you know, where, where are you going? Where are you expanding your own knowledge base and, and experience base? Yes. Well, I'm, I'm seriously studying what we call now nanoeconomics, which is the, you have macroeconomics, uh, microeconomics, but uh, working with poor people in, in these informal settlements, we discover that there is a huge 40% of war economy is informal, of the books, uh, what they call stealth economy, and that's what we call nanoeconomics. And that's a very interesting field to study. Um, we work also in another field that is uh, studying is e-performance, so turning online learning tools into tools to work. We, we are in one example. 20 years ago, this was kind of a pie in the sky. <laughs> But, but today it's kind of obvious that the world is not going back in, entirely to offices or, um, or real estate. So we have uh, to think, rethink universities, we have to rethink the way we, we configure work and um, process. And the third thing I'm working in is uh, I'm writing a book on societal performance. And in my free time, I'm, I'm part of, a, I'm writing in short fiction in English. Um, so it's a way to, um, to use all the fiction we write in consulting for a good, uh, interesting, fun time. I think that uh, Robert Major uh, preceded me on that. He used to write uh, spy notes, no? Yes, uh, and, and uh, even Joe Harless wrote a book on fiction, which is uh, one of my favorite uh, 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 fiction books, but um, yeah, so that's interesting. So, so tell us a little bit about this book on societal performance. Well, 
basically the idea is uh, from performance improvement to value creation. It's, it's tracking the process. Um, you know, there is this famous Isaiah Berlin article called the Hedgehog and the Fox. Um, academics are uh, hedgehogs. They have one big idea and they build a system around the idea. And consultants, we are like foxes. We are basically doing a lot of little things. So when I started thinking, okay, I'm going to do something to bring sense of this, I discovered that all these little things could come together in a, in a bigger picture. And Roger helped me a lot with this big idea. So what I did is uh, building the process that goes from helping people at the individual level, team level, to reach the next uh, level of organization and then bringing uh, the process to, and, uh, to, to the societal level. And um, the idea is in the book is working that. We, we are working also with John Lazar in what we call pediatrics. Management is, MBAs are usually a lot about helping big companies to move or reform or restructure or engineer. But there is more and more um, yeah, the need for understanding how startups and young companies, and like babies, they wake up at night and they do a lot of bad things, nasty things that you have to take care of. So there is, we follow like a developmental application of Erickson's theory, stages of growth from childhood to uh, adulthood to old age, and how to, to work a company through the process from the kitchen table to the market. And we deal with, with Gay also, um, a three stages model for that. So that's another thing I keep coming to. When, when will that book be available, do you think? Well, I'm, I'm finishing one about Barrio 31, the experience in, in Argentina, uh, that I have to deliver the manuscript uh, by the end of this year. Next year, I, I think I should be able to, to have it for, by, by June. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So tell us a little bit more now about these books of fiction that you're writing. What, is, what are these about? Well, these are short stories. Mm. Uh, I come from a family, my two uncles were um, fiction writers. One of them is pretty famous, Julio Cortázar, for Spanish-speaking people. is together with Borges, uh, probably uh, one of the most famous. So I grew up in a, in a family that had a lot of uh, passion for short stories and fantastic stories. So my stories are usually uh, fantastic. For example, a guy in Buenos Aires who's a... a clock maker that finds a passage from his place in 2015 um, to Buenos Aires 1935. And he changes himself as well into a different person from the clock maker to a da tango dancer. And everything happens from there. So everything, uh, that kind of crazy stories uh, that, uh, um, keeps you uh, entertained uh, outside the logic. Well, very interesting. I'm looking forward to uh, all of these books to, to see them. Um, let's, uh, is it, my next question is uh, about our language in the business, in the field. Uh, you come at this from a much broader perspective than people who are involved in instruction. But um, what I'm looking for is our, is there a, a favorite uh, performance improvement term or phrase that you would like to share with us and define for us? And when I set this question up, I'm usually asking, you know, saying perhaps it's a, it's a phrase that you feel is being misused or misconstrued. It doesn't have to be that, but uh, if there's something that you would like to correct or something that you would simply like to share, um, your definition of, of uh, a term or a phrase that's part of our field. Well, um, thinking of repurposing some, some concepts, um, there is a famous uh, dictum that uh, what is good for General Motors is good for the country. Actually, 
the correct way is the other way around. And that was the way originally was said, that what is good for the country is good for General Motors. So um, the idea of uh, figuring out the big picture first and then go. The other would be the first step in strategic planning is a step backward. So take distance and try to figure out the woods instead of a tree or the woods that are this tree is part of. So before you jump into consulting, it's good to be able to do a step backward and look if you are going to jump there or elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Let's, uh, let's go back and explore perhaps some of the uh, people that you mentioned earlier in an earlier question here of the, the people who influenced you. And let's go a little bit deeper on you know, what you got from them. And again, this is intended to help others understand a little bit more about these people and what value they provided to you. And perhaps we'll have a new audience for what they, what they uh, wrote about or taught. So, um, but let's start off with, uh, on, a, on a sad note, and then maybe we shift into a happier note here, but we just lost Roger Kaufman just not, not even a week ago. And um, we've both known him for uh, decades and he was very influential. But uh, so if you were to share with us, you know, several things that uh, Roger taught you, um, what, what, what might they be? Well, um, as you know, um, Roger was uh, like a brother to me. He was a younger brother, more adventurous, um, more creative, and I was kind of his general contractor, like a crazy architect that develops uh, great ideas and he was in charge to figure out how to make these work. So I learned a lot of things just by the first thing that Roger did was challenging, was telling you uh, inconvenient truth and in the, in the most inconvenient but humorous possible length. So one of the things I learned from Roger was the importance of establishing a, a humor report with whomever you are talking of big topics. A lot of people reading Roger think that mega means big. And the th first thing that Roger asked when he was introducing the ideal vision, he thinks it's a king of the world kind of vision, that take out your a picture of your loved ones you have in your pocket. Look at the picture and think about that. That is me. So um, that was his ability to convey um, that really the important uh, concept uh, is on the people, on the person you are dealing with. And he was a master in connecting. He was kind of a the perfect match, a great matchmaker. Um, we didn't know it, but later on, you and me are examples. We brought, we were brought by Roger into all kinds of partnerships and, and friendships and, uh, and uh, sibling rivalries as well, because he, he liked also to pull people uh, into questioning. So that's one thing I, I think that will be hard to replace now I'm trying to uh, do something that Roger told me and he's turning over part of my general contractor role to a new person. She's a woman, she's from Argentina and she's working um, um, good enough to think of her. So my role like Roger should be to do matchmaking more and connecting other people. And that's the idea of creating a, a Kaufman Center we discussed with him um, he was also very keen in helping me personally to, to figure things out. Yeah. So, um, uh, Pralahad, you mentioned you mentioned uh, him before, and and one of the the famous articles is. But but um, tell us a little bit more about what you think uh, um, he might um, mean to other people. What he might uh, the value that he might bring to other people. Well, Prahalad was a, um, a very interesting um, 
person. Um, I never met him personally. I worked with people who was working. I, I, I started, I met Prahalad, let's say this way, working with the CEO of a company that asked me to put together um, workouts, GE work type workouts, but with the idea of uh, competing for the future. Um, a book by Prahalad that had these incredible, interesting ideas. What is going to be our business in 10 years from now? So for Prahalad, whatever you are doing to address the today scenario is, is just um, irrelevant. The, the important thing is how this plays into, are you part of a future or are you just uh, waiting for the future to happen? And one of the things he saw early on was that uh, the value creation happens better uh, in need, in deep need. It's therefore, the bottom of pyramid uh, innovation is the source of a lot of modern ideas, not less than then the smartphone. I mean, um, AT&T developed these cheap phones to, to sell in Africa. And, um, and in Africa, I would say, what are you doing with cell phones in Africa? They don't even have electricity. Well, they can use batteries and charge the batteries with bikes. But the point is, what is the use for? Well, the use they discover the, is that if you carry, you know, perishable goods in your head or your back and you have to sell the bananas and you go to a place, the guy who's there is going to tell you the price. But if you can call before, two or three places before going on food, you can call the price. And that's a 35% more income. So that made of um, Africa the first and largest market for cell phones. And this is one of many, many examples of um, innovation brought from BOP. So that was another thing. I'm working currently with Prahalat's daughter, Deepa, and we are going to institute the Prahalat Award uh, for social innovation. So with Roger, we said the Kaufman Award is dealt with the uh, what innovation and the Praha Labor Award is about the how. So that's excellent. What about uh, Peter Drucker? What, uh, what are some of the takeaways that you would uh, uh, point people to in terms of what they can learn from the works of uh, the late Peter Drucker? Well, Drucker was a, a Renaissance man. And that, that I think is the thing I appreciate more about him. Um, he, encouraged, he said that management is a liberal art. Sorry, engineers, but <laughs> oh, by the way, mathematics is also a humanity because whatever happens only in your mind, whether it's literature or uh, calculus, uh, is humanities. The, the other parts are, you know, natural sciences, which are <laughs> So, train uh, as an, an economist, his first um, in 1914, it was about economics. He was um, always looking to the big picture and to the multidisciplinary approach and trying to um, um, add value um, based on the, the, again, the future. There is an anecdote. He has a, um, a very nice article called the um, my life as, an in, as a knowledge worker, something he invented, coined the term. And he said um, that um, when the Phidias, uh, the sculpture, made it the front uh, of the temple, the Parthenon, he presented the invoice to the accountants in Athens. And the accountant said, okay, this is nice, but we are going to pay you half. Because from where you are, you can only see half of the statues. So the other part of the statues is, that's no value. And Phidias said to them, respond to them, okay, but this is a temple. Yes. So the temple is for whom? For the gods. Yes. Well, the gods can see the whole statue. When you work, said Roy, uh, Drucker, when you work as a consultant, remember for, for whom you're working. Really. Excellent, thank you. So you have a, a few more names here on the list. Let's let's uh, let's cover them. 
uh, I'm sorry if I'm going to mispronounce anything here, uh, Gonzalo Rodriguez Villanueva. What, 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 uh, what can uh, others learn from him? Well, Gonzalo is a um, economist by training, um, Mexican uh, academic, and uh, but overall, he is one of the most creative minds I ever seen, and he is always a he he push us. I remember going. But he was the one who started the idea of, of graduating, not just uh, companies but uh, ecosystems, region, so value chain. And then registered them as if they were students in a, in a program. So I remember going to Roger and others, like having meetings with Gonzalo, and I was just taking notes because it was like having a, um, a canvas of great uh, approaches, a very enthusiastic and positive guy. Um, and uh, he, he created, uh, as a matter of fact, he started with this program and now is basically working on a mega region between Arizona and Sonora. When you think of the wall in between Mexico and all the politics about that, well, we delivered the Kaufman Award last year to the governors of Arizona and Sonora that actually had been working together for several years. Um, and the economy of both states is absolutely dependent on each other. So besides of the other problems, <coughs> they have to, uh, and they work together. And that's one of the things that Gonzalo worked, uh, always thinking we are, if we are going to develop this program is to help Mexicans to stay in Mexico and export knowledge instead of just um, exporting people. And, uh, and in that sense, you know, both sides of the politics of the issue will agree. So, and that's what happened in, uh, in Arizona. So uh, these kind of big ideas and brilliant ideas are, are Gonzalo's characteristic. Thank you. What about Ryan Watkins? Oh, wow. Well, Ryan is, um, is an um, introverted genius. <laughs> it's, like a, uh, it's like the, um, it's a low voice. It's kind of a um, very, um, you, you have to, to do a little effort to get uh, to, uh, to see. Ryan is uh, um, a rigorous thinker and also a guy who looks, uh, is, is a, what Ruth Meredith Belding um, uh, worked about. One of the roles is the, the person who's in a team, the person who finds uh, things, who can search. He has a we share science website, which is wonderful. You can see all the things that are in research, serious research. And, um, and he's that kind of connector, always the, the guy who um, will be careful in weighing the things. A perfect component, a, a perfect uh, balance for, for Roger's adventurous approach. <laughs> <laughs> And there's uh, Ingrid uh, Guerrero Lopez. What uh, what what might people look to her to learn? Let's say if you could combine um, the genes of Gloria Stefan with um, Stephen Hawking's, you will get Ingrid Guerra. Okay, she's brilliant. She's energetic and. Um, what she does, especially, is uh, evaluation, her field, and um, impact evaluation. Uh, she's now working as a dean at uh, uh, Wayne State University. But she's really, really a, a dynamic. She, she helped us a lot. In our program, she was in charge of helping people doing research. And that's, in itself, something very critical. Because, you know, you have been there. Uh, Preparing a dissertation is discouraging at best. So what she did was creating a program to help you make it <laughs> and to put that in, in tailor to each individual. So instead of having a, you know, a, a director of dissertation, remote director, uh, she really created like a coaching system that helps 
people to, to do it. So it's really good at that. And also to report um, with, with, uh, with people, both languages. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, she's one of my favorite people from ISBI. Uh, tell us a little bit about Dean Spitzer and, uh, and what uh, you might expect uh, that others can learn from him. Well, Dean, um, speak about energy. This is a, um, Dean, Dean is like a dynamo. Uh, I brought him to Argentina after reading his book, uh, Super Motivation. He, he made a, the most uh, interesting model of getting uh, the, basically what you could say is, is a Gilbert model, uh, like, a, like a bullseye where you, you see all the elements that uh, make people do things better or worse. And she emphasized that the idea of motivation is basically, let's start with the motivator. What are the things that prevent you from doing your best? And, and look at those things and then target those things. Because if you can reduce the demotivators, you, chances are that you will be able to get the best. So people, Actually, you cannot put motivation in people. We know that. Um, but we, you, you can remove all the uh, drag that uh, affects people's performance. Mm -hmm. And he was doing that in, in very fun and interesting ways. And um, we had a lot of fun working in uh, several banks and projects in Argentina back in the mid-90s. And uh, then at night, we were boating uh, in the Delta uh, River while uh, he was... Um, singing uh, Moon River <laughs> with a good <laughs> voice. <laughs> I'm, so he's a, he's a dear friend. Um, now he's enjoying his tennis and uh, his retirement in Florida, but we, we stay in touch. And he's a very positive person. And you know, the kind of people you, I mean, everybody loves to work with. And uh, Gloria Geary, who uh, is known for electronic performance support systems, um, can you point to anything that, uh, and I, I don't know if she's still in, in actively involved in any of that, but uh, she's left quite a legacy, I think. Uh, what, what would you share uh, about her? Well, yeah, yeah. She, I think she retired from... Technology. She's working on kids, uh, disadvantaged kids in, in, in distant countries. And uh, she is a, a very interesting, would be, um, if, if I think of Gloria, um, I immediately have the impression of um, someone who's no nonsense and thinks in practical terms. What she did with electronic performance support systems was well, so powerful. We call them now a apps. <laughs> so, unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, the EPSS was expensive but hard to market. Of course, apps are quite a different now, but it's basically the same idea. I remember uh, we developed the first EPSS for banking. And this was the kind of problem that, that Gloria helped to solve. I mean, we have to train 200 tellers. They have to work with a computer and they had to learn a lot of concepts, taxes, etc. Uh, and we cannot take them out to, to get training. So we developed a EPSS screen that was basically guiding them to ask questions to the person in front of them. And, um, and that simple tool, which is the basis of all apps, was one of her ideas. So developing a path that um, helped you to ask questions and then you are learning, but the person who's working with you doesn't know. And um, all these things and um, explain in a very simple, uh, simple way. Uh, it, she was the Julia Child of, uh, of uh, instructional uh, design. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, the next person here on the list is uh, one of my favorite people, the late Gary Rumler. So uh, what would you share about uh, Gary's work and, and what would you point people to, to and what they might learn from his work? Well, Gary, Gary uh, was absolutely 
a delight to work with. Uh, I was lucky to to get the opportunity to work with him at the end in the, uh, these years I mentioned, right before, two, two or three years before his passing. And I had to convince him to, to travel from, thankfully, from Tucson to, uh, to Obregón, where we were working, uh, wasn't that far. And he, I remember he saying to me, looking at what we were doing, and I think we were in a hotel in, in Obregón, and said, we are like the, the electors here. You know, the electors, the, the bone year. <laughs> so, well, uh, yeah, but the electors are flying now. Um, so what, what he injected was a lot of, first, he was amazing with the ability to do picture things, to draw things. So if I, if I may say, I, let me show you one thing I learned from Gay. Yes. I can, this is the consequence. I cannot work without uh, drawing. And he was drawing all the way and helping us to work. And, you know, that white board that you draw. Mm -hmm. Very powerful to do allow it. Because the other thing he was, he was, um, he didn't really like to teach. He liked to discuss ideas. He was really, in, a, in, the, in the best sense of the way, he was the Uber engine. A guy who helps other people to think through uh, complex problems. In, uh, and I, I think it was a, a, amazing to work with him and, uh, and Dale. They were also a team like Dale and Angeli were like Roger and I, myself. So they were very complementary one of each other. And um, uh, I mean, people really enjoyed them tremendously. Yeah, but I, that was one of my one of my favorite people as well. My only critique of your drawing is that I didn't see any little stick people on there, which was you know Gary's you know uh, trademark almost. Uh, this this okay. I'm not that good at it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the last person then uh, is uh, the late Bob Mager. We just lost Bob Mager a few months ago, and uh, he was very important. So you you've mentioned the six pack. You mentioned. Uh, that first book, Analyzing Performance Problems. Um, what, uh, what, what could, we, could you say about Bob Mager, Robert F. Mager uh, for our audience? Um, if, if, uh, if Gloria Giri was the uh, Julia Child of instructional design, I think that uh, Bob Mager was the Mark Twain. Uh, um, he had this ability to put in a simple language, powerful concepts, the, the algorithm to analyze the problem is so good. Uh, the question like, is there any punishment for doing the, the right thing? Or is there any reward for doing the things wrong? And that's a powerful, simple question that people immediately uh, get excited about. Okay, we can solve a lot of problems by just asking that. The other thing I think he was really good at explaining the difference between criterion and norm reference. Uh, we live in the, uh, the era of the um, norm reference uh, things. So we are the best of the mediocre. Uh, the, the less bad of the, and, and we continue to do these things. I mean, in the percentile, um, 95 of uh, the, the um, chapter 11 keep. Um, so that kind of thing um, that he explains so simply like, okay, and then writing objectives based on behavior. Uh, so it's not what you say, but what you do and just show me. And for, for, for those in education, um, that, that got a lot of Yes, <laughs> let's put it that way. Uh, yeah. But he was also humorous, an incredible, powerful tool. That's why I mentioned the Mark Twain thing. Mm -hmm. the, the American slang, you can see the title, no? and um, also the idea of I can make a joke about that. So you will remember uh, 
that that I think was great. Well, thank you for sharing all of that uh, about those fabulous people. Yeah. Priano, thank you so much for agreeing to, to participate with me in this video interview. My final question to you is that, uh, do you have any parting words of wisdom for people who are uh, new to the field, just coming on board? What, what would you recommend to them? What would your, your guidance be for them? Um, well, um, besides the step backward, the other thing would be um, don't be afraid of wandering outside your box. Um, if something good that among all the good things that Roger brought, is, uh, reality is not divided in this. So this morning I was talking with a friend who's an engineer about, uh, but an engineer doing other things. We are working in this barrio in the slum and trying to figure out how to help people there. And one thing that, that um, is clear is that the first engineers were um, a lot of other things. Think of Leonardo. So a Leonardo's approach is important. Try to look around, look at the things that can help. Maybe something about history is helpful, uh, something about uh, art, uh, something about uh, theater, something about... So, and, and then don't be afraid about using mathematics. Uh, and, and, and formulas and, and logic and algorithms. So you can, you can also use all those things. Uh, you can do a better job by learning more things than the things we were trained for. Yes. Again, Mariano, thank you so much for doing this with me today. You have a great day. Likewise, likewise. <laughs>